Good morning. Dwayne Hubbard here. Happy Mother's Day. Um, we're actually recording this uh, Sunday afternoon. Today we had a breakfast in uh, honor of the women in our church. Most of these women are mothers, but some are mothers in the sense of having poured their lives out in uh, teaching, in service, in helping to raise uh, the children of our church for decades, some of them. We honor them all today. Now, last week we began a four-week study about the Sabbath, um, the day of rest. That word, Sabbath, actually means rest. In our men's Sunday school class, uh, loyal, the Loyal Sons, we noticed that the Jewish people took the simple command, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, and turned it into an almost impossible set of laws and rules. And one of the things that Jesus got charged with by the Sanhedrin was that he healed people on the Sabbath. Who knew that healing anyone was illegal on any day of the week? Apparently it was. So today we're going to look at a very familiar scripture and see if we can learn some insights about the Sabbath, about rest. But before we start, I want to tell you a story that the writer of our Sunday school book, uh, Mitch, uh, Michelle Morris, told about one of the families uh, in her church. This is our, our Sunday school book, Adult Bible Studies. This, this uh, unit's writer is Michelle Morris. And in her uh, student book, she tells this story of a young man who was waiting for an organ transplant. The liver disease had come on him suddenly, and now not only did he need a liver, but he needed kidneys. You know what else he needed? He needed to gather with his family and feel their love. He was in the hospital. Under normal circumstances, he would have been surrounded, but these were not normal circumstances. These were COVID days. So he was restricted to just one visitor, one visitor, his wife. And she did her best to help him know that there were people all over who were rooting for him, praying for him, and he was grateful to her for that. But you know what? He missed his mother. And to make matters worse, he knew she was in town. She just wasn't allowed to see him. And then they came upon something. They called it the COVID loophole. The hospital staff allowed him to go to the chapel whenever he felt the need to pray. If other people happened to be at the chapel at the same time, well, so be it. Imagine his mother happened to be in the chapel the same time he showed up. He was so excited, ready to visit, but his mother stopped him and said, wait, before we visit, we will honor all that God has given us and all that we're grateful for. And what, let's do that by reading Psalm 23. They did, they visited. And as the young man laid his head down in the hospital bed later, he took a deep breath. Now he could rest. He could have his Sabbath. Well, Psalm 23 is a psalm of hope. It's a great description of God's love for us. In this short passage of Scripture, um, there are nine ways that you can, uh, that the Lord is our shepherd. And we're going to go over that, but let me read you the, the Lord's Prayer real quick. And I'm going to read it the way I learned it in the King James. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me 
in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I remember my brothers and sister and I had to memorize this uh, this passage of scripture, this chapter, and recite it to our dad. That and the 100th Psalm, he loved both of those. And, and that was one of our memory exercises about the Bible. Like I said, there are nine ways that the, that the Lord is our shepherd. And in the first verse, he, he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then the nine things fall from that. I don't, I have nothing that I need, nothing that I want. Because here are nine ways the Lord provides for me. First, God lets me rest. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He lets me rest. He has, we have a Sabbath in a comfortable place. God lets me stop and be. We can thank God here in our comfortable United States for nice for a nice grassy meadow or like we had this morning a church full of loving people second he leads me to still waters um, he leadeth me beside the still waters in the King James these folks David's ancestors passed through the Red Sea with all the power of God holding the water back. But now what is the promise? Now you'll find still waters. You'll find quiet waters. Imagine that power that it took to, to hold that water. The noise, the chaos. And now the, the promise is He'll, he'll let me find some still waters, some quiet waters. And it will take care of their thirst. Thirst for what? Whatever. Knowledge, peace, water. <laughs> God takes care of us. Third, he restoreth my soul. He lets me catch my breath when I'm so tired that I can't feel like I can put one foot in front of the other when everything is on my nerves, when everything anyone says, I take offense. But what does God do? He restores my soul. He lets me rest. He gives me rest. Fourth, he leads us in, in the paths of righteousness. I like that. The, the King James says, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake leads me in paths of righteousness. In other words, when we're looking for righteousness, we don't have to blaze the trail ourselves. God blazes it for us. He makes it a clear path to follow. All the brambles, all the weeds, all of the, the thickets have been removed and we see the path where God has gone ahead of us. And he does it for us. He does that thing for us, which is just fantastic. Um, I think it's, it's great that he says he does it for his name's sake. Who is his name's sake? My name's sake is McLean Monroe Hubbard. God's namesake, number one, is Jesus Christ. But real close, second, is me and you. He does it for us. Next, fifth, when I walk through the worst thing imaginable, I can lean on God. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know, 23rd Psalm is read at so many funerals. And why? Because it gives us peace. It gives us hope. Um, 
that shadow that it talks about is real. That um, shadow of death is real. We all are under the shadow of death. But you know what God does? God lets us see past the shadow of death. Um, that fear that that shadow causes can be conquered when we lean on Jesus. Sixth, God has brought weapons to the fight. What does he say? He says, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When I walk through that thing, we can lean on God. Why? Because he's brought some weapons to this fight. He has um, a rod and a staff. He's not, we're not showing up for a bare-fisted fight or a fight where we have no defense at all. God has brought us our defense. He has his rod. He has his staff. And the rod and the staff are powerful. What's number seven? Number seven, those folks who are our enemies are so puny that God's going to take a break and have a party right in front of them. He says, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Our enemies are inconsequential. God is going to have a party for us right in front of them. And it's just to prove how weak that they are that he does that. What's the eighth one? God is going to make us the most distinguished guest at the party. We're going to be the ones that are the favored guest, he says. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup, my cup runneth over. Our cup is going to be so completely full that if we tip it a little to the front or back or left or right, the good stuff is going to spill out. And you know what else? God's going to anoint us with oil. He's going to make our hair look great. He's going to dress us in the best linen. We are going to be anointed with holy oil. And what's number nine? Goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And what? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness, mercy, all the days of our life. And then what happens at the end? I get to dwell in the house of the Lord. I get to go to be at the church and feel that joy every day in that house, God's house. We'll have the truest Sabbath ever, wherever. I don't think that we go to heaven and it's like um, sitting on clouds and play, playing harps. I love to play my trombone. I don't think I'm going to be trombone playing, sitting on a cloud. I think we're going to be the most alive, the most productive, the most useful that we've ever been when we get to heaven. And the best part of it is that usefulness and that productive part of us will be put into use to help God in the best, most fullest way we ever have. And that same God is going to provide these nine blessings now and forever. Amen. I want to tell you, happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Lord, we appreciate you. We love you so much. We appreciate the women who have helped us, who have led us, who have provided examples for us, who have kept us between the ditches, who put in the work and the word to correct us, who put up in the work and the word to teach us and to lead us where we need to be so that we can follow your path. Lord, I thank you so much for them. As we think on our mothers, we think only good thoughts. Help us to remember our love for them. In your name we pray. Amen. I look forward to being with you next Sunday for another of our Methodist Moments.
Goodbye.